Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us once again. You know, for many Jews and others, the Palestine-Israel conflict can be a real dilemma. Growing up Jewish, knowing your people's history, the oppression, the Holocaust, you grow up in a Zionist world, thinking Israel is our salvation. Then, if you're lucky, you begin to see the contradictions. And for me, it was the Six-Day War, a war I almost fought in, and then the occupation of Palestine, the West Bank. It was a turning point. Meeting Israeli leftists and Palestinian activists challenged what I always believed. And now, the occupation of Palestinian land, the absolute oppression of Palestinians, the apartheid-like reality of their lives, the recent assaults on Gaza, the deadly attack on Jenin, and this new neo-fascist right-wing government in Israel has begun turning minds and hearts of people across the United States and around the globe. We're going to examine those changes and what they mean. Phyllis Bennis wrote an article in The Nation magazine entitled, On Israel and Palestine, U.S. Electeds Are Out of Touch with Their Own Voters. It's showing up on public opinion, media coverage, and even political and policy discourse. Phyllis is an Institute for Policy Studies fellow, where she directs the New Internationalism Project, also a fellow at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. She helped found the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, spent six years on the board of Jewish Voices for Peace, serves now as her international advisor. She's a noted scholar and activist uh, who is consulted with numerous U.N. officials, and twice was almost named the U.N. Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, and has written 11 books, and joins us once again here on The Mark Steiner Show. And Phyllis, welcome. Good to have you with us. Great to be with you, Mark. So, I, you know, doing the intro sometimes, when, I, when we get this, this could be, I can make it even longer, but I try to shorten it. <laughs> Shortening is good. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about the kind of the, the, the overall sense of the piece that you wrote and what is happening now, especially in the United States, when it comes to the unthinkable, untouchable for most people, which is the critique of Israel and moving away from its support. What, what do you think is really going on here? What, what, what's un, what is underpinning all of this? Well, I think what's changed is not only because of the latest set of atrocities, the latest attack on Gaza or the election of this much more explicitly fascist. One of the leaders of the current government, for instance, the minister of, uh, of, of finance, Smotrich, mm. uh, identifies himself as a fascist homophobe quite proudly. Mm. Uh, you know, there are two supporters of parties in Israel who years ago were so extreme, deemed so supportive of racism and the call to racist violence, that they were actually expelled from the Knesset, which in the context of Israeli acceptance of anti-Arab racism, you have to be pretty extreme to get <laughs> kicked out of the Knesset, but right. they were because right. they were so extreme. They're now in the government. You know, They're now the leading voices uh, of this government. So there's been a very clear shift to the right, um, but there's also been a movement in this country which I've been part of, you've been part of, you know, and is engaging far more people than ever before, young people in particular, young Jews, young people of color, young Democrats, who have massively shifted their understanding of the Israel-Palestine question overall, partly because young Jews growing up, it's not like when I was growing up in LA, you know, if you were Jewish, it was all about Israel. That was your identity. It wasn't really about God. We never talked much about God. Um, we talked about Israel and we supported Israel. That was, you know, my first organizing was as a Zionist organizer. Uh, and I learned a lot from it about how to organize. Um, but then I changed what I was organizing about, of course. <laughs> but, you know, this isn't, this isn't just one thing that has changed. But now young Jews grow up identifying proudly to be Jewish in terms of the legacies of social justice that have always been part of Jewish legacies, Jewish history, Jewish realities. And the question of Israel is no longer central to their identity. Uh, what we're seeing certainly is the rise of explicit critics of Israel among young Jews, anti-Zionist, non-Zionist, a whole range of views that are all critical of Israeli treatment of Palestinians, recognizing it as apartheid, but also coming to that identity in the context of identifying with social justice movements, with the Black Lives Matter movement, people, young Jews who were mobilized in the summer of 2020 uh, with the killing of George Floyd, 
and see their commitment to social justice in that context. So everything around us is changing and this recent uh, explicit rise of extremism or rise of explicit extremism, I suppose is the way to put it, uh, has just accelerated that already existing uh, process. So I think that's really what we're, what we're seeing. And you know, this happens first at the level of the public and you see it in these amazing polls that we've come out, some of which I, I reference in, in my yeah. recent piece in The Nation, uh, but you also see it in actions of leading academic organizations, the, the most recent being the American Association of Anthropology, or American Anthropology Association, I guess it's called, which is the leading uh, academic organization of, of professors of anthropology who voted uh, quite overwhelmingly in support of a resolution criticizing Israeli treatment of Palestinians. Uh, it was it was a very powerful uh, reality, and it's not the first. You know, we've seen this with the uh, with a number of other uh, academic institutions, starting with the Middle East Studies Association, with the um, uh, MLA, the Modern Languages Association. So there's been a bunch of these, and that changes the discourse. And then we see it in the media. You know, the mainstream corporate media, which is still very problematically uh, not even-handed, shall we say, to put it in its most polite terms, uh, still pro-Israel in a, in a very powerful way, but nothing like what it used to be. You know, you now see Palestinian voices routinely on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington right. Post. You hear Palestinian voices on NPR. This is, this is now taken for granted. The word Nakba, the, the word that the Palestinians use, it means uh, the the catastrophe in Arabic, the way they describe the battles that led to the creation of the state of Israel in 1947 and 48, and led to the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes, the refugees who have never been allowed to return to their homes. Uh, you see that word in the mainstream press as a matter of course. So there's been an enormous shift. And now the final part, after you get to the popular shift and the media shift, then the key is, when do we get to the policy shift? And that's the hardest of all. But even there, we're starting to see a little bit of it. You know, we're starting to see shifts in the Democratic Party. The question of support for Israel is by far a more partisan issue now than it's ever been. You know, the big goal of APAC and other parts of the pro-Israel lobby was always to make sure that support for Israel remained a bipartisan reality. You know, God forbid it should, it should be only the Democrats or only the Republicans. And for a long time, it was much more dominant in the Democratic Party because for years in the, in the 50s and 60s, you know, when I was growing up, Israel was seen as a proto-socialist country. Support for Israel was a kind of left-wing thing, and it wasn't so great among the, the Republicans. But people started to learn that that wasn't really quite the case, you know, and that the role that Israel played in the world, the role that it played in the region, the militarization of Israel, the, the, the billions of dollars that the U.S. was giving every year directly to the Israeli military to be used for things that were in complete violation of international law and the laws for protecting human rights, and even U.S. laws that say that U.S. weapons cannot be used except in very, very narrowly defined circumstances that Israel has routinely ignored. And no one in Congress, no one in the White House has ever held them accountable for that. So I think that's really the conditions we're looking at right now. You quote a bunch, several polls in here, and they really are kind of mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, the Zogby poll. 63, One of my favorites. <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a great guy. 63% of Democrats and 40% of independents said Israel's West Bank settlement should be torn down and the land returned, as you wrote about. Yeah. And the Jewish Electoral Institute showed that 25% of U.S. Jews viewed Israel as an apartheid state. Right. And 38% of young Jews yes. said it's an apartheid state. Right. That's extraordinary. So, That's extraordinary. Uh, two questions for you about this. I mean, A, talking about why you think this shift has taken place. 
what's the underpinning of this shift? Let me just start there. Then I have a second one. Well, I think partly what I spoke to earlier, that there is a sense, and it's very generational, among young Jews, that their identity as Jews has far more to do with being supporters of human rights and social justice writ large than it does with the specific support for Israel. There are just not as many young Jews growing up caring very much about Israel. And those who do are overwhelmingly, increasingly critical of Israel. They're concerned with it because they hate what it's doing in their name. You know, you see all around the world organizations that pop up that are called some version of not in our name. And it starts with young Jews uh, who are outraged at what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, whether it's the assaults on Gaza, whether it's the theft of Palestinian land, whether it's the, the displacement, uh, the, the uh, detention of children. You know, only Israel, for example, only Israel among all the countries in the world has an explicit juvenile military justice department. It's, it's shocking that 12-year-olds can and are arrested by the military, held in military courts, put on trial before military judges, and treated as if they were military threats, 12-year-olds. We look at this question of apartheid, which you know is not new for Palestinians and ironically South Africans, who have for many, many years viewed Israeli practices as violating the international covenant of the, against the crime of apartheid. But it's very new for mainstream human rights organizations. It's only in the last three or four years that you have the most uh, influential and preeminent international human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and the key Israeli human rights organizations like B'Tselem and Yes Gvul and others that have determined that Israel is in violation of that international covenant and is violating the laws against apartheid. Not because it looks like South African apartheid, it doesn't look anything like that. But what they share is that violation of international law, this specifically the, the laws against apartheid. So you have that only emerging in the last maybe three years, four years, and it took a very long time. In both Amnesty and, and Human Rights Watch, for instance, there was great reluctance at the highest levels of those organizations to explicitly criticize Israel at all years ago. It took a long time even to get there. And once that happened, once there was an opening, it again took a very long time before the leadership was willing to agree to even investigate and do the kind of really thorough legal investigation, interrogation of Israeli practices that finally the, the analysts who know this stuff inside out were prepared to argue it and win those arguments to say, yes, this is apartheid. And they have different versions of it. Some say it, it exists only in Israeli treatment of Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Some say that it's uh, it applies to Israeli treatment of Palestinians from the river to the sea, meaning within 1948 Israel and all the occupied territories. One of the most important uh, identifies it as including not only all of the territory, but also the treatment of Palestinian refugees, saying that the definition should be applied not geographically, but to people who are affected by these laws. So people living all over the world who are Palestinian refugees or Palestinian exiles who are denied their internationally guaranteed right to return to their homes are victims of the crime of apartheid as well. So there's differences in how they apply the law. But what they agree on is that Israel is violating the laws against apartheid. And that's had a huge impact on public opinion, in the media, in, among men, members of Congress, among churches, in, among the clergy, very influential faith leaders like Reverend Dr. William Barber, 
the leader of the Poor People's Campaign right. and the head of Repairers of the Breach, who has just opened the new Center for, if I get this right, Center for Popular Diplomacy and Popular, ugh, I'm, getting, I'm getting the title wrong, but it's essentially a new center in the Yale School of Divinity oh, that's right. designed to train up a new generation of faith-based activists working for social justice. And Reverend Barber is the founding director of that new center. He has talked about Israeli apartheid uh, against the Palestinians. So it's become normalized to use that language. So uh, where do you think, a couple of quick things here. I really want to get to it. I think w when you write about the 12 Jewish members of the House, 25 senators um, really critiquing the occupation and the slaughter. I mean, putting in there the, the rocket attacks against Israel, but balancing it out in ways they've never done before. Right. Um, with with the uh, outright oc occupation and the death of Palestinians. And, and I wonder where do you think this is? And you're not prescient, but, you have, but you're brilliant and have great analysis. So <laughs> where do you think this is taking us? What do you think? Well, what do you think is going to? What do you think this, this could possibly take this country politically when it comes to Israel? I think that it is taking us clearly in the direction of a complete reconsideration of the long-standing assumptions of U.S. relations with Israel, ranging from the billions of dollars guaranteed to go to the Israeli military every year. You know, President Obama for all of the racism with which he was treated by by Netanyahu during his presidency. He was the one who negotiated and signed off on a 10-year memorandum of understanding, guaranteeing to the Israelis that they would get a minimum, not a maximum, but a minimum of $3.8 billion a year directly to the Israeli military. No accountability to US laws that say it can only be used for self-defense, that any uh, unit of the military that has committed a, a crime of uh, a violation of human rights cannot have access to those weapons. All those things are put aside uh, in the case of Israel. This is where real Israeli exceptionalism emerges. You know, we sometimes get accused in the, the movement for Palestinian rights is accused of treating Israel differently than we would treat all other countries. And I wanna say sometimes to people who say that, really, did I miss you at the last protest at the Saudi embassy that we were protesting? <laughs> did I miss you there? You know, because we're not the ones that are trying to treat Israel differently. We're trying to treat Israel like every other country is treated. And it's our government that treats it differently, that exempts it from accountability. So I think we're moving very directly, not quickly. And this is the challenge. How many more Palestinians will be killed in assaults on Gaza, in the pogroms of Huwara, in the assault on Janine's refugee camp? How many more will be killed? How many more children will be arrested before the policy changes? But I think we're heading directly towards that shift in U.S. policy to normalize relations. Nobody's saying we, sh we shouldn't talk to Israel or we shouldn't have diplomatic relations with Israel. But ending the kind of privileging that Israel has had, whether it's the billions of dollars of military aid, whether it's the protection of Israel in the United Nations so that the United Nations Security Council, either the U.S. will veto or will discourage from even being brought up any kind of resolution or protecting uh, Israeli officials, whether military or political officials, from ever being held accountable at the International Criminal Court. All of these are gifts. They are privileges given only to Israel. So at some point, we're gonna start rethinking that and Congress is going to start saying, you know what? We don't need to do that anymore. Whatever we think about what happened in the past, Whatever members of Congress think about how it used to be political suicide to even criticize Israel, we're moving towards a reality where it's going to become political suicide not to criticize Israel. We're not there yet, but we're getting a whole lot closer. You know, you mentioned those two examples of the, the group of, of senators and the separate group of members of the House at the time of the 2021 Israeli assault on Gaza, right. uh, where they came out publicly urging their own president to reverse course and call for a ceasefire. The other part of that that was even more extraordinary came from a group of Democratic Party operatives. 500. 500 of them. These were the former leaders of the 
uh, the 2020 Biden campaign. Right. The people who elected, who got President Biden and Vice President Harris into office. And they wrote a letter, 500 of them signed off on this letter that went way beyond what the members of the House and Senate teams had written. Their letter was extraordinary. They referenced the 73 years of Israeli oppression of Palestinians. They spoke about settler colonialism. They referenced apartheid. Their letter went way beyond. And the important part of that was not just their, how they showed their commitment to justice. That's certainly important. The other part of it that was so important was that they were hereby recognizing officially that it is no longer a fear that we have that we won't get another job in the Democratic Party if we criticize Israel. They were recognizing the gap that exists between the electeds and the base of the Democratic Party. It was a stunning letter. I mean, I, I, we will attach to um, that people can can uh, look up when they see this article and also attach them to our conversation. Um, and I went through that list and I went through all 500 names to look yeah. at them. There were a lot of Jewish names in that list. Also, absolutely. The the rise of Jewish Voice for Peace, which I'm very proud to be a, As an you should be. member of. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish Voice for Peace is, is now... The, as I understand it, the fastest growing uh, Jewish organization in the country. It's not the biggest, but it's the fastest growing. And it's now got something close to 20,000 members and somewhere around 300,000 regular uh, supporters online who are reading it and, and following and responding to its calls. And that's huge. That, that you know, hasn't ever happened before. So I think that at some point, the political uh, cost of supporting Israel is going to outweigh the political advantage of, for example, avoiding the possibility that the, the pro-Israel lobby is going to decide to fund your opponent in the next election and risk losing your seat. You know, it's going to be a bigger risk at some point to refuse to criticize Israeli treatment of Palestinians than the potential of a financial loss uh, in the form of, of support for a new opponent that you didn't have to face in the last election. So this, this, well, there's one thing before we close, because we don't have much time here in, uh, in, this, in our conversation today. And as I look at this, it's not, this was not in your article, but I think about it all the time when I read these articles and think about the things we've done over the last 50 years in the struggle is that anti-Semitism in this world runs very deep. And I said something sometimes, it's an anathema to some people that kind of yelled at me when I first said it, which is that for the first time in our history as Jews, we may be causing the eruption of anti-Semitism itself because of what Israel's doing. And what, besides the opening of consciousness among young Jews and others in America around what's happening with Israel-Palestine at the moment, there's also the real threat of what it can unleash Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, that, and that's something I think about that I've not fully kind of thought through completely, but I, I just wanted to raise that with you. No, it's a very important question, Mark. The, the rise of anti-Semitism in this country right now is greater than it has been since the 1920s, when right. the Klan uh, was lynching Jews. Not as many, not as, con not as consistently as they lynched African-Americans, for sure. But there were Jews who were lynched because they were Jewish. Anti-Semitism was was and remains a, a key component of far-right racist identity. The Klan still holds Jews responsible for all the, the, the bad things in this country. The, the march of, of uh, the Klan and other fascists in, uh, in 2017 in Charlottesville, their chant right. was, Jews will not replace us. Jews right. will not replace us. And we see right now, we're seeing the jury d debating the, the, uh, the sentence for the murderer of the, the, the Jews in Pittsburgh, which was a straight up right wing anti-Semitic attack that is rooted in white supremacy. And one of the things that we're dealing with right now is that the, the, the weaponization of false claims of anti-Semitism claiming that somehow criticism of Israel is, is anti-Semitic. Right. There's an effort going on to normalize a, uh, a very dangerous definition of anti-Semitism put forward by the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, whose own author said this should never be used 
as a legal definition because it will completely deny the right of free speech. He just put it forward as a kind of working idea for how to think about anti-Semitism. But in doing so, he raised a very dangerous thing, which is being used all over the country to weaponize that false claim, accusing people who criticize Israel of being anti-Semites and then saying, you see, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. That's what we have to challenge. What that does is prevent us from challenging the real anti-Semitism that is on the rise, that's rooted in white supremacy and racism in this country. And that's what's on the rise. That's what's the danger to Jews in this country and around the world right now. And by keeping the focus on for, for not only the right wing, but centrist and liberals of various sorts who are insisting on, on supporting Israel and claiming that criticism of Israel is somehow anti-Semitic, they are undermining the actual important efforts at challenging the real dangerous anti-Semitism that is actually threatening Jewish communities all around the world. So there's a very clear uh, obligation that we have to fight against real anti-Semitism. And one of the ways to do that is to challenge the weaponization of false anti, uh, anti-Semitism that has made that challenge to the real kind much more difficult. Well, this is it's always a fascinating conversation we have with you, fellas, and I, I deeply appreciate you taking the time, and thank you for the work you do, and we'll be linking to all the articles, uh, to this article and other parts of that article uh, as you uh, on this website. So, Phyllis Bennis, once again, thank you so much for your work. Thanks for joining us here on The Mark Steiner Show at The Real News. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Phyllis Bennis, noted author, activist, Institute for Policy Studies fellow, where she directs the New Internationalism Project. And we'll be linking to her article and more on the site, so please check that out and all of our other work. And thank all of you for joining us today. And thanks especially to Cameron Grandino for running the show and Kayla Rivara, for whom this would not be happening. Please let me know what you thought about today's show, what you heard, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll get right back to you. And while you're there, please stay around and go to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly donor. Become part of the future with us during our summer campaign drive. So for Cameron Grandino and Kayla Rivara and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.